You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Welcome to Dolphins Talk Weekly, your one-stop audio breakdown of all of this week's Miami Dolphins news. Now, here is your host, Kevin Durr. This week's episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly is brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Canesware.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship to you. International fans, too. Canesware.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Canesware.com. Canesware.com. And we are back for another episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly. As I record this on Sunday evening, you will know by now that the Dolphins lost Another game in, in heartbreaking fashion at the end, 30-27 to 27 in Orchard Park. The drought against Buffalo on the road goes on. The Dolphins fall to 2-6. and six. And any eventualities from this point on uh, essentially have to be playing for pride and trying to figure out what you have in some of these young investments that you've made over the past couple of years. Uh, as this season, I think you can throw just – about any expectations you had out the window at this point if you hadn't done so already. Hate to start the show off on a negative basis, but I'm your host, Kevin Dern. You can follow me on Twitter at KevinMD4. You can follow the show at DolphinsTalk.com, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, wherever else you listen to your podcasts. We are there. Check out the articles on DolphinsTalk.com. And I don't know what else to really say. Um... No whiskey segment for me tonight. I do have a couple of early morning meetings uh, need to be sharp for tomorrow. Um, but switch it up over the weekend and, and watch some college football on Saturday with a nice glass of Widow Jane 10 bourbon. Uh, pretty good. I think I've reviewed it on the show before, but that was kind of my, my switch up for the weekend. And Saturday was nice. Um, watch some college football. They had postponed the trick-or-treat in our neighborhood until Saturday night because of some bad weather on actual October 31st, that Thursday. So I got to take the kids out. They loved it. I was very impressed with them. They made it to about 45, 50 houses this year, whereas last year I think we made it to 12. You know, they are four and two, so, you you know, expectations aren't super high for how many houses they're going to get, but they did a nice job, and they had a lot of fun with it, trick-or-treating with their cousins, so... That was a cool thing to at least have this weekend, you know, making a memory with the kids. And the Dolphins Bills game Sunday was, and I listened to Kyle Krabs' podcast before sitting down to record this. And I think he put it nicely. That was kind of a memorable game in this rivalry that really hasn't felt like a rivalry since the arrival of Josh Allen. I think with the loss today, that brings the Dolphins' record now to four and fifteen against the Bills since Josh Allen, or excuse me, since Chris Greer has been the quarterback. I think it brings it to two and fourteen since Josh Allen has been there. So, just uh, this one was a heartbreaker because so many of the things that we or that I have talked about and other podcasters have talked about and. If you caught my appearance uh, filling in for the same old Dolphins show on Thursday that uh, Josh and I talked about, so many of these things that we've wanted to see from Mike McDaniel and his ability to not chase the game flow, to have a good pulse on the game, to not abandon the run when down by a score. You know, I I call it not Jim Tressling it. If you get that Ohio State reference, bonus points to you. Um, all of that stuff, it happened today. That that performance today from McDaniel in terms of game pulse and, and his ability to sequence plays and call plays, 
that's what the Dolphins have needed the last two years when they've been in these big moments and, and pissed away so many of these big opportunities. They needed that performance. And I think, by and large, you can say the same thing about Tua Tunga Vailoa. Um, probably, in my opinion, one of the two or three best games he's had as a Miami Dolphin, not necessarily in terms of the box score, um, but just in terms of overall efficiency and operational procedure and not pressing, not making bad decisions, doing the right thing with the football was really, really good today. Only three incompletions. One of those was a, a throwaway because the Bills had snuffed out a screen. So really only two incompletions on the day. Like it was just absolutely dialed in. I think really the only two nits you can pick on are, again, mishandling a shotgun snap, although even if he did handle it, um, he's either going to have to throw it away immediately or he's taking a sack because Greg Rousseau was right there. Um, I don't know how much hope there was for Tua to do anything more than that on that play. And then the deep ball to Tyreek, I think if you leave that out in front of him, that's probably a touchdown, and you ended up with a field goal on that drive. But I'm not going to fault that on a a throw like that with with a safety still having leverage over the top on the play. This is the type of performance you probably wanted to see more of if you're Steven Ross before committing to that big contract. But this was it. You know, even the last two drives, two fourth quarter touchdown drives to come back and get yourself back in the game, tie the game at the end, and made a playoff improv. You know, two plays really, the die for the first down on the scramble, um, and then the maneuverability in the pocket to hit Jalen Waddle for the touchdown to, to tie it. Very impressive game from Tua Tonga Vailoa, and, you know, even his box score took a hit just because of, you know, you're in desperado mode on the very last play where Waddle, you know, reversed field and lost 24 yards. So offensively, you know, I, I, this was major improvement from Mike McDaniel and more of what I've wanted to see from Tua Tungavailoa. And, and we'll get to some of the errors that plagued the Dolphins as a team, you know, both offensively and defensively this game. Um, it's a damn shame that they didn't come out on top with, with those types of performances because that was, at least offensively, that was the performance you've needed to have against some of these winning teams, against the Bills in particular. You know, two is now one and eight as a starting quarterback against the Bills. But against these teams in the playoffs the past couple of years, these are the types of offensive game performances you've needed, you've needed to have when they're, they're taking away Hill and Waddle to be able to find other answers, to be able to rely on the run game. You got Devon Chan involved in the pass game. I believe he had eight receptions. You know, you got Mostert involved in the pass game. You were able to work in Jalen Wright. You did some nice things with blocking in terms of how you used Malik Washington, how you used Alec Ingold again. This was the performance you, you've wanted to see and just didn't get the job done. And ultimately, you know, you look at, you're up 10 to 3, you come out of the half, you get the ball. Raheem Mostert has played really well in the game up to that point. You're moving the ball, the opportunity to go by at least 10, if not 14. You know, does that change the outcome of the game if you go up 13 to 3 or or 17 to 3 right off the bat on that long drive? I don't know, maybe. But the Raheem Mostert two times in the last three games now has fumbled the ball. I think that's now seven fumbles he's had in the last 17 Dolphins games he's had dating back to last season. That's far too much. And we'll talk about this later as we close the show. And this is a point that Kyle Krabs made. So I'll hat tip to him for this, but at some point you have to have some honest, hard, conversations now if you're in the Dolphins facility come Monday morning about what you need to do for the rest of this year because the season's only at the halfway point you still got nine games left to play and you got to play them um I I would say I thought this was the best opportunity or not best opportunity but, but 
in terms of having Tyreek Hill on the roster, this was the best performance that they've been able to get out of him in a game against Buffalo. I thought Tua was very accurate with the ball, made some really tight window throws, uh, that third down to Jalen Waddell on the, the final drive the Dolphins had where they scored. Uh, the throw to Waddle for the touchdown was a great throw. Um, he had an, an early one in the game to Durham Smythe over the middle. That was a big throw. A couple of those slants to Odell Beckham were pretty tight window throws. Um, you know, that one was just, it was a, it was a great back and forth game, which started out slow and the second half exploded. Um, running the football, you know, Miami, I think, ran for about a buck fifty, averaged like 4.8 yards per carry. Devon A. Chan, you were able to get him 20 touches. You got Jalen Wright, six touches. It's just, I talked about this on the same old Dolphins show. Going into the games today, Buffalo had the the best turnover differential in the NFL. The best. They were plus 11 in takeaways versus turnovers. You even got a turnover off of them. And Josh Allen's been playing out of his mind this year. Um... You know, so the turnover battle, you didn't win it, you didn't lose it. But, man, it's just, you got points on the board for Buffalo after that. You got a field goal off of the short punt from Jake Bailey. Like, just those small breaks in the game, the stuff that Miami isn't perfect at is what comes back to bite you in the ass and, you know... They haven't put all the nails in the Dolphins' coffin yet collectively this season, but, but they're, they're getting close. And one more loss probably sinks your ship. And you got a tough opponent who just won a crazy game today in the Rams come Monday night next week. So, you know, hats off to the offensive line. I thought they performed really well. You know, Buffalo... Didn't really have many pressures on Tua, um, other than the one where Greg Rousseau got in there on the the mishandled snap. Did a really nice job. You open holes in the ground game. You're able to get out in space in front of some of these screens. You know, I thought Rob Jones had a nice key block on the touchdown pass to Devon Achan. Odell Beckham Jr. had a nice block to kind of seal the lane for Achan to get in on that touchdown pass. You know, you did a lot of things right offensively. And against a team as good as Buffalo, it's almost like you've got to play perfect. And they were pretty close offensively. Defensively was another story. Um, kind of followed the same flow as the game from Arizona the week before. You know, you did some nice things early on. And, you know, it's hard to count the number of times we've forced Josh Allen into a three and out since he's been the Bills quarterback. But you got that done, I think, twice in a row to start the game. Um, it's just, it's unfortunate. You didn't have the horses, obviously, you know, Chubb's not back. Jalen Phillips isn't, is out for the year again. Zach Sealer's missing time. You didn't have Javon Holland in the game. You didn't have Cater Kohu. You got a pretty valiant effort from a lot of the defense, not all of it. Um, you just you just don't have the horses, and I think Anthony Weaver called about the best game he possibly could have, given what he had to work with. Now you got some favorable penalties uh, to wipe some points off the board and take some big plays off the board, especially towards the end of the first half. Uh, but man, it was unfortunate. You know, I thought. Chop Robinson probably had his best game as a pro. You know, I, I thought he was going to be in for a rough day with Deion Dawkins, and Deion Dawkins has a, a, magnificent, a magnificent snatch and trap move where he'll basically snatch you and throw you down. Um, I thought Chop Robinson kind of learned from that. He, it happened to him a couple times early in the game, and from kind of there on, Chop had some nice work got a couple pressures got his first career sack today um thought he held up in the run pretty well but you know jones had a nice game it was interesting that last week after such a poor performance from david long he was benched in favor of anthony walker so that you know that's some 
accountability on some level there. You know, you had such a poor performance that you benched David Long. Um, but that kind of goes into some of the overall problems that we don't, we, you know, haven't been rectified under Mike McDaniel during his entire tenure is that accountability thing. Um, you know, Jordan Poyer's penalty, it, it's there's no reason for that. I think if he had actually had his head up, you might have had a chance to intercept that pass if you went in not with your head down. Um, I thought Cam Smith was in good position, got his hand out, made a nice play as best you can these days as a corner in the NFL. And you went from having a third and nine where you're airing it out deep and you give the Bills another chance. Same as happened on the third down last week against Arizona. Jordan Poyer, through no fault of his own, gets put in the middle of the field safety spot by Anthony Weaver and just gets completely toasted by Trey McBride. Now you have him just with a a, a stupid penalty as a veteran of however long he's played, 10 years. You need to know better at this point. I've hated that signing since the second it happened. Jordan Poyer has just been a complete travesty. It's a waste of a roster space at this point, and you need to have some of these hard conversations when you're going to the building tomorrow. Jordan Poyer serves absolutely zero purpose, and he's made zero fucking impact. He's a bullshit player who's overrated, uh, coming mostly based off of reputation for what he did in Buffalo, but Micah Hyde was the better of those two. There's no purpose for him to be on the Dolphins roster after tomorrow. Like, there's literally not a purpose he serves at this point. You know, and Kyle Krabs made the point, like, you've you've experimented with Elijah Campbell for a number of years now. At this point, at 2-6, and six, why, why would you not start playing some of these younger guys? Why would you not play an Elijah Campbell more? Why would you not see what you have on, on Channing Tindall if you're not going to play David Long? You know, you need to stop pussyfooting around with the Quentin Bells and the Tyus Bowsers up front and give Mo Kamara as many reps as you can to figure out what you have down the stretch. You know, if you do end up trading someone like a Calais Campbell or a Teron Armstead, you need to find out what you actually have in guys like Neil Farrell and Patrick Paul and Deshaun Hand. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get messy. But you need to see what you have in those guys. And I think that's one of those things. I'll I'll look just directly at at Mike McDaniel for this one. You need to have the same conversation about Raheem Mostert as you do Jordan Poyer. Now, Raheem's done a lot of good things for the Dolphins, and he's done some good things this year. But two fumbles in two of these games that you've lost by one score – how big are those two fumbles in terms of being the difference between being two and six and four and four right now? Like, you're a nine year veteran in the league. You just spent a third round pick for next year on a rookie running back this year that you can't get many touches to. That needs to stop. You need to rely pretty much exclusively on Devon A. Chan and Jalen Wright moving forward, unless there's an injury. Like You have to figure out what you have in those two guys before you move into next year. And I think this kind of illustrates some of the poor roster planning and, and draft considerations the Dolphins have made. Like I get that you have guys like Channing Tindall and Eric Azucama that were day, well, not necessarily day three picks, but essentially both day three picks that have hardly seen the field at all. You've spent future resources for this year's team that isn't seeing the field really in your first three picks. You know, Chop Robinson's played a lot and you need to keep feeding him more. But Patrick Paul's only played, you know, offensive tackle reps in two games. One of those was a one rep game against Seattle. You need to figure out what you have in these guys before you have to put them in positions where you're going to be relying upon them in the future. Now, Jalen Wright, I think we all kind of universally acknowledge, like, seems to be the real deal but you need to be relying on him more and see what kind of a workload he can carry moving forward and i think that's kind of what i'll be looking at is is if you're going to bench david long 
why haven't you benched Jordan Poyer? Because I, I'll, I'll concede that David Long probably had the worst performance of any Dolphins defender on the year last week against Arizona. But Jordan Poyer has been almost that bad in every game this year. Like, I don't know that there's a bigger downgrade that you've had position by position, like a like-for-like like analog, than from going from Deshaun Elliott to Jordan Poyer. Like, it's been a complete waste of a signing. And that's that's kind of where you're at as a Dolphins fan this year. Like, there's not much to look forward to. You've got guys who you've drafted. Like, I forget who it was. Someone put this tweet out, but it's, you know, Cam Smith was making year, rookie year mistakes in year two because he didn't play as a rookie. You know, Cam Smith is a guy that you need reps from. But now you look at what happens if you get Cater Kohu back. Is Cater Kohu your third corner all of a sudden? Or do you need to shut down someone like Kendall Fuller for a game for Cam Smith to play? Because Cam Smith needs reps. He's going to be here for the long haul, you know, meaning the next two or three years. I don't know that you can say that Kendall Fuller is or Cater Kohu is. You know, and if some team comes calling with the right price, I don't know that Jalen Ramsey should be if you can get a lot for him. Although he's played tremendously well this year, and I think there's a lot you could do to kind of help him age gracefully and maybe even transition into safety. But this is one of those times where usually I don't pay much attention to the trade deadline and in season. You know, I don't know that it's a great mechanism to improve your roster. Be that as it may, you've got some benefit recently out of Bradley Chubb, who's injured now. But I, I think at this point, you have to, to try and sell off what you can and get what you can get back to start stocking the shelves for this retooling effort, we'll call it, at the moment. That's likely to take place, you know. Uh I, I like Anthony Weaver's scheme. I think he's, for the most part, game planned pretty well. I, I think Arizona was his worst coordinated game. I've been pretty impressed by both of the efforts they've put forward against Buffalo so far this year and, and how he's implemented those game plans. I think today was just merely he doesn't have the resources necessary at his disposal. You need to beat a quarterback as good as Josh Allen. And, you know, you have to give the defense credit. Like, there were some corrections from last week. You saw Emmanuel Ogba be able to position himself better against that QB sweep play, which was a direct copy of what Arizona ran last year to ice the game. Or last week, not last year, to ice that game. Ogba made the stop this time. You've seen some better coverage plays from Cam Smith. You've seen Chop Robinson improve. I thought the linebacker coverage was, uh, you know, a non-issue today, which is something you don't really say after many Dolphins games. Um, so from a coaching performance, I think this was their best game of the year, and it's a shame that it took until the eighth game of the year to get there. And I think it's a shame that it took Mike McDaniel two and a half full seasons to have that type of a performance because. That type of coaching performance and, and awareness would have served them very well in games from last season. I think back to Philadelphia. I think back to the road game in Buffalo early in the year. I think back to Kansas City in Germany. Maybe a little bit in Baltimore, although that one kind of got away. Buffalo at the end of the season. And it's a shame that it's taken that long, but if you can sustain that improvement and be better at that, then maybe maybe you have a the opportunity or wherewithal to kind of earn your chance back to coach this team next year. But I think looking around at how you've constructed this roster and how poor some of the internal evaluations are, like... I know they would have liked to have had certain players back, like Christian Wilkins. And again, that was much closer to happening than, than most people will ever know. Um, but the Andrew Van Ginkle thing, there's a lot of murkiness to that. I won't touch that one at this point. 
you know, letting Rob Hunt leave for that amount of money seems fine, especially given the performances that you've had from the offensive line this year. I think that's one thing that they finally got somewhat correct. But looking at how you've managed these assets, you know, looking at opportunity cost draft picks, you know, taking Channing Tindall a pick right before Leo Chennault. You look at Skylar Thompson, like five picks over Brock Purdy, although I'm not going to fight them over what Brock Purdy's become. That was a perfect situation. Um, you know, it's just, it's just tough. Some of the situations and misevaluations they've had along the way with with Chris Greer, and you know at this point you're you're in your ninth season as a general manager. You're four and fifteen, trying to beat Buffalo. You haven't won a tangible thing. It's time for a new voice, and it's time for someone who has a better idea of how to structure a roster to be in charge of this team. And I don't. I don't know that Mr. Ross would do anything in season or what that accomplishes from a general manager's perspective, um, but it, it's time. It's been beyond time now for a while to to get Chris Greer out of the team, and I think I'm dead set that, that he needs to go, and I would have a hell of a lot of questions if he's retained. Mike McDaniel after today, I was on the clean house train I think that's what you should do anytime you're restructuring your organization like especially given all the half measures Ross has taken in the past but something from that way the team fought today there weren't many discipline issues today the way McDaniel kind of strategized and and played that game flow and how he called plays and how Tua was able to navigate that although you still have to look at Tua's availability in terms of the broader picture like that's a thing like it or not and you have to be prepared for that like it or not and the Dolphins weren't so I think they need a new voice and a new vision and a new set of eyes sitting atop of all things football operations now, whether that's a new general manager who has ultimate responsibility or whether that's a general manager and someone above that person in like the Bill Parcells role from way back in 2008 and 9, I don't know. And I don't know that Mr. Ross knows. But you need someone who isn't Chris Greer to be running this franchise from a football perspective moving forward. Like you cannot let it just be him again. Um. I think today was the ultimate microcosm for it because I'll go back to, you know, a very salient point that Josh made on my appearance on the same old Dolphins show on Thursday. He had brought up the Chasing Buffalo series I did back in 2021 going into that season, the last year that Brian Flores was the head coach. And it was basically looking at, you know, how badly Buffalo beat Miami in that 56 to 26 game to close out the 2020 season that knocked Miami out of the playoffs even though they were 10 and 6 how close could they get and i think as we sit here today you're probably further away from buffalo than when i started that series in a lot of respects you know i i think you're closer in some respects with the way that maybe the run game has improved with the way two has grown Although the learning curve there, I think, compared to some of the other quarterbacks, is much has been much slower to kind of start that upward upward arc. But defensively, in terms of personnel, you're further away. In terms of game management, up until today, you've been further away. Because let's, let's be honest, if we go back two years to the win over Buffalo in Week Three, the twenty-one to nineteen game. That was much less to do with Mike McDaniel and much more to do with Josh Boyer calling his magnum opus that day. One of the best defensive game plans I think I've seen out of a Dolphins defensive coordinator was Josh Boyer in week three that day. And you just got Herculean efforts from the the defense being out there in the sun for as long as they were. You didn't have the horses to get those Herculean efforts 
today. And it'll forever pain me that kind of the cornerstone of this whole rebuild process in 2019, which was the first guy you drafted, Christian Wilkins, isn't here to kind of be that leader and be that voice on defense the way he was. And I think you're still searching for that player. And I think that poor planning and poor foresight is kind of the damning factor for me on Chris Greer. And I think where you go from here for me is let's see how accountable Miami is towards number one, playing the younger guys to see what you have. You need to stop playing these veterans that serve no purpose anymore. Number two, what do they do to stock the roster? Like if you go out there and trade future assets for like a pass rusher at this point, you know, you're just pissing on your own shoe, (laughs) not doing anybody any good. So what do they sell off, you know, by the end of the trade deadline, if anything? And three, can Mike McDaniel keep up the coaching performance? Like I get that you're, you're probably not going to win all nine remaining games. The schedule does get softer to the point where I think you're going to scratch out some victories. But at what point does it get that bad? Or at what point does it get bad enough that the team just stops showing up? That's going to be my litmus test for Mike McDaniel. If you can keep it together and get them to fight hard and play through the whole year, you know, I think maybe you deserve one more shot. Is Love him or hate him or say whatever you're going to say about Brian Flores. But that team fought like hell to get from 1-7 to 9-8 in 2021. What does this team do? That's what I'm curious to see. It's a shorter episode this week. I think we all kind of feel the same collective, you know, end point. You know, we're at that fork in the road time of the year and it's not January yet. I've never enjoyed a Black Monday other than maybe the day when Adam Gase was fired. Uh, I'm very interested and intrigued to see what happens this year's Black Monday. Um, Because I don't know which heads will roll, but there are heads that need to roll in Miami. And, you know, two months from now, uh, that that seems a long way off, and I wish you could sim to the end of it. Um, But I think that's kind of the... Is that the light at the end of the tunnel or is that just the train coming through is, is kind of where I'm at with it. So we'll, we'll have another show. We'll do shows every week like we always do for the most part. <laughs> um, next week, since it is a Monday night game, I will probably do the show on Tuesday or Wednesday night and have that out midweek for you guys. That's going to do it for me. You can follow me on Twitter at KevinMD4. You can follow the show on Spotify, iTunes, Wherever else you listen to your podcast, follow the show, follow the writers on DolphinsTalk.com. Stay safe, everybody, and fins up, I suppose. This episode of Dolphins Talk was brought, Talk Weekly was brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com. Caneswear.com.